so our next speaker is Melissa Youngquist. Uh, she is a research biologist at the Shed Aquarium, and she studies the response of wetland communities, primarily amphibians, to restoration. Before coming to the Shed, uh, to, excuse me, to Shed, Dr. Youngquist was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Minnesota. In collaboration with the U.S. Forest Service, she studied how the invasive emerald ash borer might affect amphibians in black ash wetlands, and that is something that is very important to us also at the Institute. Uh, she completed her PhD at Miami University in Ohio, where she studied the effects of habitat in agricultural landscapes on amphibian populations. And we did see in our last talk of the morning how agricultural landscapes can affect some of those amphibians with the Blanchard Cricket Frog. So thank you so much for joining us, Melissa. All right, thank you so much for inviting me to join this conference. Um, and so this image here that I have is of two toad metamorphs. Uh, the larger one was from a breeding event at uh, sort of a normal time in, in May. And the second metamorph was just recently um, sort of emerged from the drying pond from a second breeding event that happened in July. And I'm gonna come back to this later as we talk about sort of resilience of amphibians to changing landscapes and climate um, going into the future. Um, we've heard before um, earlier with Kyle and perhaps all of you who have any knowledge of amphibians that we have global declines. And the story of doom has been uh, pervasive in the a sort of public literature or the scientific literature of the past few decades, right? Lots of reviews talking about trends of amphibian declines and extinctions, um, news from like National Geographic showing that half of all sort of amphibians are at risk and questioning about whether we are in the midst of a sixth mass extinction event. And we, we look at sort of where declines are happening globally. We can look at maps of sort of hot spots of decline, um, which again, um, encompass the world wherever amphibians are found. But if we focus in on sort of the Midwest region, this is not a hotbed of declines. Not to say we don't have our fair share of species that are at risk. Uh, some species are listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. Some are candidates and some are candidates to be candidates. In addition to these, we have species that are perhaps locally abundant in some areas and suffering declines and others, uh, things like the cricket frog that Travis just talked about, which is, seems to be sort of thriving in the southern parts of the range and had experienced declines at the northern, eastern, and western edges. And so all this is to say that populations are declining, but we have not yet had any extinction events here in the Midwest. And so this offers us hope that species are resilient and we still have time to protect our amphibians, to try to keep our common species common, as well as try to keep our rare species from going, um, becoming more rare or even going extinct. Um, and so I'm gonna present two case studies that I have worked on that I feel show this resilience of our Midwest amphibians to changes in the landscape. The first comes from my work in Minnesota as a postdoc um, looking at amphibian communities in the North Woods. And so here are two questions that we were looking at is, are these black ash wetlands, are the communities there unique within the landscape? And how might these communities respond to the last of ash um, caused by the invasive emerald ash borer? And then next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work I've started in Chicago in the last couple of years, asking very similar questions about kind of the other side of that coin, right? So we wanna know which species are occupying these urban wetlands and this time, instead of asking what happens when invasive species comes in, we wanna know what happens when we remove invasive species and restore these habitats. How does the amphibian community respond? So we're gonna move north to Minnesota. And this is uh, where emerald ash borer uh, comes in. And so it was discovered in the United States in the early 2000s, but had likely been introduced to Michigan in the 1990s. And over the last uh, two decades, it's kind of spread all across um, Eastern uh, North America. And in 2015, when I began my postdoc, it had just entered Northern Minnesota. And this caused a wide cause for concern because Northern Minnesota, Upper Michigan, really is uh, the hot spot for black ash. Black ash is one species of ash tree, all ash trees in North America are susceptible to emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer kind of bores into 
uh, the bark to lay their eggs and the larvae um, eat the sapwood, which then basically starves the tree to death and ash trees die off um, in about five or six years. And so the Forest Service uh, back in sort of 2012 really got invested in figuring out sort of how you can control emerald ash borer through silvicultural methods, as well as trying to figure out sort of what's happening in these ecosystems and what happens um, if they all die out. So looking at sort of what happens when we have this forested wetland habitat and if it loses all its ash trees and becomes sort of a sedge meadow, what will happen to the plants, the soils, the water, and the, all the animals that live in these habitats? To answer these questions, um, they began with an experimental study back in 2012, where they looked at different silviculture treatments that had been employed to try and combat black ash or the emerald ash borer um, in other areas. And so they sort of uh, right here on the middle of the upper north woods, um, did different experimental treatments on a large scale where they had sort of clear cuts, um, group selections and girdled trees as well as controls to look at how primarily the plant and hydrology of these systems would change. And then they were also planting um, different species of trees to try and figure out if all the black ash dies off, how can we keep these forested ecosystems forested and are there any replacement trees? And then the second phase that began in 2016 or 2017 was to try and get a baseline understanding of the diversity of different black ash sites within Minnesota because black ash grows basically any aquatic system. Um, they are the primary deciduous uh, wetland. And so you have um, through these riverine floodplains can be black ash wetlands. We have large expansive flat wetlands and then smaller depressional pools. And so the hope was by surveying across all these sites, we can get a good baseline of sort of characterizing all the black ash wetlands that exist in the Northwoods. And my role um, from 2015 to 2019, um, so about three field season, was to characterize the amphibian community in these habitats. I had collaborators with the US Forest Service and University of Minnesota, who were looking at the hydrology, at the plant communities, as well as other vertebrates in the system, uh, like birds and mammals. And I'm gonna focus my talk here on these reference sites and not the experiment because these experimental sites when they are selected for the silver cultural treatments did not have good amphibian breeding habitat within them. And so I didn't have enough statistical power to actually analyze how amphibians respond to these treatments. Um, but I did look at amphibian communities across the range of habitat types, as well as in non-ash forests. And I'm not gonna present the birds and mammal um, results here, but I do want to say that both birds and mammals respond strongly to the loss of ash. So in the experimental treatments, we saw this um, shift from basically forest community to open meadow community in terms of the species composition. And when we look at bird communities in black ash forests compared to non-black ash forests, black ash wetlands are a biodiversity hotspot for birds. All right. So one of our first questions was to characterize the amphibians that live in black ash wetlands across the north woods of Minnesota. And these are our five species that were found breeding in these habitats. So wood frogs, spring peepers, blank, uh, sorry, boreal chorus frogs, and blue spotted salamanders were the most commonly encountered. And gray tree frogs were found in a couple sites. When we looked at trying to predict how this community um, is affected by these different types of ash forests, whether they're depressional wetlands, flat wetlands, or these riverine floodplains, it all came down to hydroperiod, and hydroperiod was correlated with these wetland types. And so in this figure on the y-axis, we have the species richness, and on the x-axis, we have the different types of black ash wetlands. And what we found, perhaps unsurprisingly, is that depressional wetlands hold water the longest, and so they did have the highest amphibian species richness. So this longer um, hydro period facilitated larval survival and recruitment, and also allowed for some of the summer breeding amphibians like gray tree frogs to colonize and breed in these wetland habitats. 
And so the next question we want to figure out is, are black ash wetlands unique in the landscape? And also how communities might shift in response to loss of ash as ash forests convert to sort of these wet emergent meadows. And so I surveyed the black ash wetlands and paired those with emergent wetlands um, to figure out how these communities change. And so this figure is an ordination plot. And so you can kind of ignore what the axes mean, but essentially um, species that are close together are more likely to be found in the same habitats. So spring peepers, chorus frogs, and wood frogs um, are all very close to each other. They're highly correlated. So the presence of wood frogs likely means the presence of chorus frogs and spring peepers. And on the other side, the same thing with leopard frogs, green frogs, and mink frogs, where these three species were commonly found in the same habitat and toads and tree frogs were kind of doing their thing. The circles are our emergent sites um, and the color means basically stand height or how tall the forest is. So these emergent sites are not forest, very low stand height. And then in the triangles are our black ash sites um, with variable stand heights among them. And so what we found, um, as I mentioned before, in our black ash sites, they're strongly characterized by wood frogs, spring peepers, and chorus frogs. These are all our early breeding um, amphibians. They are able to metamorphose before the black ash ponds dry. When we look at the emergent sites, our emergent wetlands had all these three species plus all the other species. So then we started gaining our tree frogs, green frogs, leopard frogs, and the occasional American toad and mink frog. And so part of this diversity is because our Emergent wetlands encompass a wider range of hydro periods. There are a lot more emergent ponds that um, are permanent, but also most species of amphibians are going to preferentially choose to breed an open canopy pond that um, increased light, has warmer temperatures for faster larval development, as well as more algal growth. And so even if we have forest species, if there is a nearby pond that's sort of open canopy, that's where they're going to preferentially breed. And so we do see sort of a better breeding habitat or preferred breeding habitat in these emergent wetlands, even within a forested matrix. So um, what does this mean and where is our hope? So black ash wetlands, they are unique and they are important in the landscape. Um, they host unique amphibian, bird, mammal, and plant communities. And as land managers try to think about transitioning into the post emerald ash borer world, and trying to keep our forested ecosystems forested, they may want to focus on these depressional wetlands that's gonna maximize the diversity of amphibians within a forested wetland. But ultimately, and this is where my hope is, for amphibians at least, is that emerald ash borer might not negatively affect our breeding populations of frogs. Um, it might actually improve the breeding habitat for these northern species. And now I'm gonna move on to Chicago, looking at the flip side of our coin, right? So instead of looking at what might happen when an invasive species comes in, we're trying to figure out how amphibians respond to when an invasive species is removed and habitat is restored. And this is a project that I began the last couple of years um, after moving to Chicago, looking at Shedd Aquarium. Um, and so very similar questions, trying to figure out sort of what species are occupying our urban wetlands and how our species are responding to this habitat restoration. Um, so this is a map of Cook County where Chicago resides and Shed Aquarium is. And as we look at this sort of land use, thinking about what challenges amphibians face in the urban landscape, right? Chicago is the third largest city, populous city in the United States. And the county is basically all developed. It's this concrete jungle with um, a few remnant green spaces remaining uh, throughout the county. And so in addition to sort of the challenges of navigating um, developed land, we've had a lot of habitat loss and degradation. Um, in fact, Chicago and most of the county uh, before human settlement uh, or sort of before European settlement uh, was wetland habitat. So Chicago has been completely drained um, and built up. And even outside of Chicago, wetlands were drained and filled for agricultural land. This image here is from the 1930s from one of my study locations uh, where drain tile was installed in order to create agricultural land. 
In addition to basically loss, a lot of our wetlands have had their hydrology changed. So a lot of sites, um, their temporary wetlands became permanent, which allowed infiltration by fish, which makes it a difficult habitat for many amphibians, or it's too short. So a lot of drain tiles was installed, but not completely removed. And so we have a lot of high, uh, wetlands that dry too soon to support amphibian um, populations. And we also have a lot of invasive species. So a lot of invasive plants are crowding out and degrading our wetlands, things like European and glossy buckthorn, reed canary grass, and phragmites. Fortunately, um, this is a well-recognized problem, and there are a lot of habitat restorations throughout the county. These are led by the forest preserves of Cook County, the Chicago Park District, and Shed Aquarium, all kind of working separately and together to restore wetland habitats. Um, and then my job um, as I've come in is to try and assess sort of what the community in these habitats are and how the restoration status, um, as well as the type of habitat that's in these preserves influences the community that we find there. So this is again, a map of the county. I'm just gonna show you some of my sites. So up North, we have one of the oldest forest preserves. It was established um, in the early 1900s. And in the last decade, they did some wetland mitigation. It involved creating new uh, prairie wetlands, grassland wetlands, in addition to sort of restoring some of our woodland habitat. In the center of the state, uh, we've got another old forested preserve that's been under active restoration for the past decade or so, as well as some very highly degraded invaded woodland habitat, mostly by common buckthorn. In the south, this is where that old drain agricultural field was. Um, again, this is part of some wetland mitigation work. The county and open lands and the Army Corps uh, removed that drain tile um, and sort of restore the hydrology to the site, creating sort of this prairie uh, wet sedge um, preserve. There are some hemi marshes that are retained in the highly industrial area in southern Chicago. And this is sort of heavily invaded by Phragmites and Chicago Parks is doing a lot of restoration work to restore the hydrology of these marshes, as well as remove invasive species. And then there's some remnant sort of sandy swale habitat um, where it's had a lot of ash die off and um, button bush. And so I've gone to all these sites, doing larval surveys and adult surveys, trying to figure out exactly sort of what's here and have they, um, have amphibians been thriving. So I have some preliminary data that I want to show you. And so this is our hope. Um, so in our very small uh, unrestored ponds and ponds that are just the beginning stages of invasive species removal, we are still finding amphibians. So chorus frogs, American toads are sort of the heroes of our story. These are highly adaptable species. They're colonizing species and they're the most common ones that we find in Chicago. And so some people may look at this and think, oh no, only two species of frogs. But I say, wow, these species can even persist in this concrete jungle in these degraded habitats. When we move to our restored prairie habitat, again, these are temporary ponds. We now see leopard frogs join the community. And so these are sites that were restored. They were kind of recreated after drainage. And so we have these recolonization, recolonization events um, happening after we recreate our habitat. And when we look at our old forest preserves that are undergoing active and continued maintenance, we start to see um, our salamanders and our tree frogs join the community. And so we don't see all these species at every single wetland, but um, within the preserves, we get our blue spotted salamanders, eastern newts, tiger salamanders, chorus frogs, leopard frogs, toads, and gray tree frogs in some combination. And as we try to think about sort of what are the main drivers of this diversity, it comes down to hydrological diversity within the preserve. And so in this figure on the y-axis, we have species richness within the entire preserve. And on the x, we have preserve hydrology, or the diversity of the hydrology. So no means it's only temporary ponds, and yes means we have some combination of temporary and permanent ponds on the preserve. 
And what we see very clearly is that when you have a permanent pond on your preserve, the diversity within that preserve increases. Partly it's because we start to add bullfrogs and green frogs to your community. Um, but even without those species, we see an increase in diversity. And when we look at sort of an individual wetland within a preserve, we see the same trend. So having a permanent pond on your preserve increases diversity present at a temporary pond within that preserve. And I believe one reason is because we create a more resilient landscape. So here's an example of one of my survey landscapes. There's this creek that kind of runs down through the middle. Uh, one side, we have Illinois Nature Preserve. Uh, this yellow, these two yellow circles are permanent ponds, and these light blue ones are temporary ponds. And in this landscape, our species diversity or richness is six. Uh, I've counted these six species um, on this preserve. And across the creek, we have only temporary ponds, and we only find coarse frogs and toads. And in 2021, we had a drought and all our temporary ponds either did not fill or they dried in May. Um, but fortunately, where we have permanent ponds, all our amphibian species were able to reproduce and had successful recruitment. And so these permanent ponds are creating essentially a refuge um, on the landscape for when we have dry years. And I wanna come back and revisit our superheroes, our chorus frogs and toads, and why they are so resilient and dynamic on this landscape. And this has to do with their sort of flexible uh, phonologies. So this is like kind of a busy figure. So I'm gonna go over it. So this top uh, figure, um, the y-axis is our number of sites, our percent sites. And along the x-axis, we have time uh, from the breeding period, basically from March through July. And in green would be the percent of sites where chorus frogs are calling. And so we see their peak calling um, period is basically late March and early April. They taper off and then end of April, early May, we get another peak and then a little bit of calling in mid-May. Toads are in this brown color and we get their peak calling periods in May um, at different times. And then this line along the top are as the percentage of sites that are still ponded. And so all our sites are wet, they're holding water until sort of mid-June and July when they start to dry. The bottom graph is showing precipitation, uh, daily precipitation. And so we see our toads strongly respond to precipitation. We get a rain event and the toads start calling um, soon after. And this is kind of the typical, what we expect from both of these species. In 2021, uh, we had very different behavior. And so very uh, the same graphs. On the top, we have percent sites where we see activity and the bottom graph is precipitation, uh, very low precipitation throughout the year. Chorus frogs kind of started calling about when you would expect um, in March and April, but they were never calling at every single site, even when all the sites were wet. We started to see some sites drying in April and May, they had a little bit of rain, they filled a little bit, but then dried um, one week later. We do have, again, this permanent site. And so not all the ponds dried. We had one that stayed wet. And um, we did have a toad calling at this site um, a few times, again, kind of following a few rain events. Uh, the thing I want to point out is that come late June, we had the largest rain event of the year. All our ponds refilled. And our toads, which kind of delayed or did not breed early in the year, had this delayed breeding um, and had successful recruitment in July. And more surprising is that our chorus frogs, which also bred early in the year, had a second breeding event with successful recruitment following um, this late rain after a drought. And so this adaptability um, in their phenology um, suggests that they're going to survive and why they are so abundant. Um, and thriving in this landscape. I'll also mention that tree frogs had the same trend as toads. So we had a permanent site. They were calling um, in May and June, bred a couple locations. And then again, following the late uh, summer rains, they again had a second breeding event um, at more sites with successful recruitment. <laughs> 
So what does all this mean? Um, trying to distill the lessons learned from both Minnesota and um, Illinois. So how can we keep our common species common and how can we prevent our rare species from becoming rare or extinct? Um, and so the first message is that restoration works. Many amphibians uh, when given sort of this right habitat are resilient on the landscape. They can persist, they can rebound and they can recolonize recreated habitats. Um, water, perhaps unsurprising, is the most important factor for our pond breeding amphibians. What this means is that we should prioritize impressional wetlands for pond breeding species when considering sort of where we should uh, focus restoration management work. Uh, that we need interconnected wetlands with diverse hydrology. And so taking this landscape perspective for climate resiliency will help safeguard against climate change and climate weirding. Um, that some species uh, like our toads and chorus frogs may be able to adapt their chronology to this climate weirding. So we know that in the Midwest that we may get storm events followed by dry periods. And so ponds may not have our, the expected fill and dry um, chronology that we expect. And so some species can adapt to that. And those that can't are gonna need refuge wetlands to sustain them um, when they don't have appropriate habitat for breeding. So with that, um, thank you for joining and I will take your questions. Thank you so much, Melissa. We did have a question on Facebook. Um, somebody asked, I've heard a loss of ash leaves, uh, for example, silver uh, for silver and maple, uh, silver and red maple, excuse me, may change nutrient levels in vernal pools negatively affecting tadpoles and salamander larvae. Is this something being studied or just a hypothesis theory to be looked into? Yeah, so there are a lot of mucicosm studies that my colleagues have done looking at sort of how different species of tree leaves affect amphibians. And we do see that with maples, some of those uh, leaves have secondary compounds that can negatively affect amphibians. I will say that out in the wild, we still have amphibians breeding in ponds that are maple. Um, and so I think that there are still some missing factors between sort of the experiments and kind of what we observe um, out in the wild. And so I think it's, it's a really complex story about the dynamics between leaf compounds, leaf nutrients, and the communities that persist. So somebody who wants to study this, here's your point. <laughs> yes. Uh, we, had, we had another uh, question come in through the Q&A. Uh, do you have any ideas for helping amphibians to connect with other populations within these more urban landscapes? How is it for species dispersal, genetic mixing to happen in these sites? And last part of this question, do you think it is possible to create artificial dispersal corridors in these urban systems? Yeah, so those are all questions I thought about, and I would love to get a grant to look at the connectivity, um, the genetic connectivity of these sites. I will say that Chicago has done a very good job of maintaining corridors with the rivers that go through the county. And so I strongly believe that the different rivers and creeks that run throughout mm -hmm. are going to be dispersal corridors and those green spaces. Um, I would not advocate for sort of moving species around if we don't know where they were previously. And you don't want to do any genetic mixing in case you get sort of this outbreeding depression or you get sort of the wrong combination of traits or species that's not adapted to the wherever you move it. Um, and so I think our hope is to kind of maintaining what already exists and allowing sort of natural immigration to occur where it can. Great answer, yeah. Nothing is as simple as we would hope it would be, right? No, we're going to just like sprinkle amphibians everywhere and let them thrive. Um, but unfortunately, reality is a little bit more complicated. That is very much the case. Uh, thank you so much, Melissa, for sharing your knowledge and everything, all the great work that you have been doing, uh, both before the shed and at the Shed Aquarium as well. So yeah, thank, thank you, you so much.